Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello, um, welcome to lecture four on uh, thermoelectric characterization. Um, after looking at some of the major uh, methods to measure temperature at the, at the micro and nano scale, today we are going to apply these techniques to look at how we actually um, uh, measure thermoelectric properties of thin films in particular. So, uh, in many applications, we may have a thermoelectric material that is only down to even submicron to up to tens of micron on a substrate. The applications could be for thermoelectric material optimization. If we don't want to have large amount of material, we want to change lots of parameters. We don't want to have thick layers. And also, techniques such as MBE allows us uh, to control the nanostructure properties of the material quite uh, precisely, but we, the amount of material produced is small. So we need to measure the thermoelectric properties, but also there are important applications because thin film are used in a lot of electronic and optoelectronic devices and knowing the thermoelectric property could be useful. For the thermal conductivity measurement, uh, cross-plane uh, uh, property is often measured using 3 omega method that I described today. There is also a laser thermoreflectance technique that I will describe at uh, tomorrow's, uh, uh, at the next lecture. Uh, for the in-plane properties, um, uh, if you want to measure in-plane thermal properties, you need to have a suspended structure because the thermal transport in the substrate dominates. Or you need to have some modeling involved that look at how the heat around some point or line sources is um, generated. And I will not discuss about in-plane thermal transport in today's lecture. How about thin film electrical characterization? Similar cases, electrical properties of thin film are important uh, for thermoelectric material optimization, but also for making uh, thin film micro refrigerators that you saw earlier in the lectures. Um, in-plane electrical conductivity and Seebeck measurements are um, uh, kind of standard. The key difficulty is we need a substrate that is not conducting. And uh, seems obvious, but uh, this uh, ensuring that the substrate is not conducting um, is a, a major challenge at high temperatures. Also, we have to make sure there is no electrical charges at the interfaces, no charge transfer, and uh, th that's one of the parameters we should pay attention. Um, and so sometimes we can uh, take the film out, make it suspended or on another substrate. In that case, stress-induced changes in electrical properties need to be taken into account. Just to show, um, uh, and this is easy, the part that is hard is the cross-plane electrical properties, because for that we need to make a device to confine current goes perpendicular to the layer. Um, and because we are also measuring the electrical current of a thin layer in series with an electrical contact on top, uh, the contact resistance limits the minimum film thickness. Often this is on the order of 10 uh, micron or higher uh, with the available uh, contact resistances. And we also need to always consider what are the substrate contributions um, to the um, electrical transport. Just to show you why these are important, here are some of the measured electrical conductivity versus temperature and Seebeck coefficient versus temperature of a thin film, in this case is indium gallium arsenide, on an indium phosphide substrate and on a sapphire substrate which was put on later on. So the sample as grown epi layer is on indium phosphide. If you grow it, uh, the blue line you see you have good values of electrical uh, conductivity measurement and Seebeck, but at high temperatures, both of them shoot. And uh, these come because at high temperatures, the substrate in your phosphide starts to conduct. And you know, if you're not careful, this is a good way to get ZT numbers more than 10, um, because you attribute the conduction of the substrate to what happens in the dream film. And the Seebeck also, the way adds up um, give uh, very high uh, power factors. But if you take the same film, attach it to a saf uh, sapphire substrate which is not conducting even at high temperatures, uh, you remove the substrate and n now make it, for example, in a van der Poel structure uh, Clavel leaf, then you have the precise measurement of the Seebeck and electrical conductivity. Um, 
So this is something that I describe a little more about what is the van der Pas technique later on and is described in this paper. How to make this bonding uniform? You need some uh, channels for outgassing uh, liquids if you want to bound it. Uh, make it uh, that these are kind of challenges that um, are material dependent, and of course this only works if we can selectively remove the substrate. So now let's look at thermoconductivity method. Thermoconductivity method, uh, the most common technique for thin films is called three omega. The idea is simple. There is a thin film, I want to measure its thermal resistance. I put a line a heater, resistive heater, and resistance uh, is a thermometer. It, it changes with temperature, and you can send a current and create heating, and the amount of temperature rise is, has to do with what is the thermal resistance of the thin film. Um, the difficulty is uh, how to do it accurately, and uh, a clever method proposed by Cahill in um, early 90s is that if I have a film a line heater with two electrodes where I send current and two electrodes where I measure voltages, usually this four probe techniques is used to avoid problems with the contact resistance contribution. You only measure resistance of a uh, straight line. Uh, so uh, Cahill's idea was that if the current is modulated frequency omega is a sinusoidal, the temperature increases because of the joule heating with current square as a component at 2 omega. Uh, resistance near uh, at the linear regime is directly proportional to temperature for most metals, so that has the same 2 omega. If now I measure the voltage across this uh, line, voltage is current times resistance, it has a 3 omega component. So that's a good way to get um, the temperature dependent property. There are some analytical expression that relates the temperature increase um, uh, that uh, can be extracted to the thin film conductivity, but these are approximation valid when the film thickness and the lines are big enough or small enough. Uh, in this um, uh, uh, book chapter, uh, annual review of heat transfer that just came out recently, you can see a lot of these um, uh, methods compared. Uh, what are the problems or issues you need to consider when you do measurements with 3 omega? First of all, there is a minimum film thickness needed. Why? Because you are putting a heater on a thin film on a substrate. If the thin film total thermal resistance is small, that's a small perturbation. The temperature rise is dominated by the substrate. You cannot extract thin film thermal conductivity. You also have to remember there is an interface thermal resistance between a metal and uh, any other uh, dielectric. And this minimum thickness could be 0.3 or even, even lower to microns, depends on the thermal conductivity and back of the envelope calculation of the thermal resistances give us what should be this thickness. Another effect that uh, has not been emphasized as much in the literature is need good electrical insulation between heater and the thin film, which is very challenging at high temperatures. Basically, if there is a small amount of current that goes from the film down to the substrate that makes it nonlinear because there are some barriers, and that gives a 3 omega component. Um, and so actually making which metal has the good property and making the dielectric under it uh, where, so that the, uh, the, uh, the electric, electricity from the um, 3 omega probe doesn't go in the substrate, um, uh, it's something that needs to be carefully optimized. Uh, now let's move to electrical properties of the thin films. That's actually something that microelectronic has, industry has been doing for a long time. If you have a wafer, you can do four probes using this technique. There are some geometrical equations that tell you how from measured current and voltages you can get the conductivity of the film. Uh, the equations are often don't uh, need to know the dimensions because things cancel out. You can do the usual four probe. This is similar to the three omega. You send current, you measure voltage. If you know the distance between them, you know the amount of current and voltage drop, you can get the uh, thin film conductivity. But the popular techniques for thin film are called van der Pa, and it's a, a beautiful work by van der Pa in 50s. If you have a sample where you have four corners, by sending current between certain probes and measuring voltage between certain others, you can extract thin film conductivity that is completely geometry independent. Uh, for this to work, you really need to put uh, tiny probes at the edge of the thin film. 
Um, uh, this can be simplified by mass structure called, um, uh, for example, uh, clover leaf. Um, where the mask, you can have a bigger connections for uh, electrodes and because the action happens here is less sensitive to the positioning and you get more accurate results. This is done all the time. How now you measure uh, the in-plane Seebeck uh, if you want to measure um, uh, 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 in addition to the electrical conductivity? Basic idea is simple. Well, this is a sample. Uh, one side of it should be hot, the other side should be cold. Uh, I need to measure the voltage difference and the temperature difference, and that's a Seebeck coefficient. The key difficulty is you need to measure uh, temperature at the same point where you measure the voltage. So often what people do is one of the probes of the thermocouple could be used as your voltage probe, um, but you need to make sure that these are the same material so you don't have a Seebeck voltage part of it. The other part which is um, quite challenging is this thermocouple uh, should be in a very good thermal contact. So you need some good thermal paste or some way to make sure that the temperature you are measuring is the temperature of the film. Um, if it's not in equilibrium, if there's a thermal resistance between uh, the, the thermocouple tip and the sample, uh, that gives you erroneous uh, temperature measurement. So all the books about good uh, thermocouple measurements are good references. You can do this simultaneously, meaning that the same four probe technique before that I showed to measure electrical conductivity, if now you put part of the sample on the hot side, the other part on the cold, you can simultaneously measure electrical conductivity and Seebeck in plane. And that's actually quite helpful because if you have one sample for Seebeck, another for conductivity, sometimes there are questions about sample to sample variations and uniformity how uh, one could do cross-plane measurements. Cross-plane measurements are more challenging because if I want to measure electrical conductivity of a film in cross-plane, I need to send current in that direction. Um, so you, I need to make a microstructure, a meso, where the current is confined, I need to put an electrode. And if I want now to measure the Seebeck coefficient across plane, somehow I have to introduce a, a temperature gradient. So I put, need to put a heater on top and the two should be electrically insulated. The heater increases the temperature uh, on one side of the thin film, but the other side is not a perfect heat sink. So often what people do is that you need to make the same heater on the substrate and by doing differential measurement, measure the uh, temperature uh, across the thin film. That kind of uh, uh, elaborate, but it's uh, doable and uh, there are a couple of papers about this. Uh, again, summarizing that annual review of heat transfer. This is a top view of the heater um, that creates a temperature difference. Underneath, you have an electrode and you measure the voltage between the top of the device and the bottom. And from that, you can get to the cross-plane Seebeck. Uh, usually, uh, the same problem with contact resistance even applies here. You are sending a current across plane. Often devices for you to be able to handle them and have a heater uh, that is manageable, you need them to be uh, 40, 50, 60 micron at least. And the film thickness is one or two. The aspect ratio is very planar. So it's very important to make sure that, that the temperature here is unif uniform and you can measure that. And also the contact resistance is another limitation. For most of the thin film samples um, that we've worked on, uh, you can measure cross-plane Seebeck coefficient if the film is uh, one or two micron thick. But the cross-plane electroconductivity typically needs films that are tens of micron thick just because of the uh, limitation due to the contact resistance between metal and semiconductor. Here is an example of where such measurements have been done. In this case is a sample of an anindium phosphide substrate, a layer that is 3 micron thick as made of a super lattice. 20 nanometer of an indium gallium arsenide, a semiconductor with some erbium arsenide nanoparticles in it, and then 10 nanometer of indium gallium aluminum arsenide. These act as barrier energy filters, and this period of 30 nanometer is repeated multiple times up to 30 mic uh, 3 microns. This sample is very inhomogeneous, in plane and cross, cross plane and in plane properties are different. And by putting heaters on top and doing in plane measurement, here are the measured Seebeck versus temperature, in plane versus cross plane. You see a factor of three difference, and that really comes because of the 
uh, the fact that you have uh, energy barriers and this is a super lattice effect. And that was described in a, a physical review uh, B paper a couple of years ago. So these are examples of how the measurements are done at low temperature at 14 films. Now um, let's describe in the last part um, some of the most exciting ways you can extract uh, ZT directly. This um, method is called transient Harman technique. It goes back to 1958. The basic idea is simple. Assume I have a thermoelectric device and I send a current and I just turn off the current at a certain time. At a given current, there is a voltage developed across the thermoelectric device. As soon as I turn off the current, the voltage drops first rapidly and then slowly. What is the physical reason? The rapid decrease is due to the fact of a resistive effect. Uh, this is just um, the fact that as soon as there is no voltage, there is no, uh, there is no current, there is no voltage across the device um, uh, due to electron motion. But even when you stop the current, one side of the device uh, could be hotter or cooler than the other side. That temperature difference creates a Seebeck voltage and that takes some time to decay. So by looking at the transient response, a tail and a sharp drop, you can compare the resistive voltage, which is due to the resistance of the device, and the Seebeck voltage, which is due to the temperature difference. Why there is a Seebeck voltage can be seen from a balance, equa balance equation. So the total voltage across the device is the resistance uh, plus the Seebeck. Resistive is IR, that's we know. And the Seebeck voltage is coming from Seebeck plus times delta T. The question is where the del delta T is coming from. Delta T can be written for any single leg device as an energy balance. Um, net cooling or heating is the Peltier effect minus Joule minus heat conduction. We will see uh, in week um, four more details about how this equation is this, the derived and how it can be expanded. But basically, uh, by putting Q equals zero, this equation is an equation for delta T. You put it um, in equation for voltage of Seebeck, which is Seebeck times delta T. In the voltage for Seebeck, there are two terms. One of them due to the Peltier and the other one due to the Joule. So why there is a Seebeck voltage? This drop has two terms, a component that comes from a Peltier cooling or heating and a component that comes from Joule effect. And um, the key question is, can we separate the two? And the answer is yes, because if you change the direction of current, this sign changes while the second sign doesn't change. So the fact that this uh, sign changes and this sign doesn't change can be extracted by uh, different polarities. And by doing that, then you can get the ZT of the material directly by extracting this number, dividing by this, you can get the ZT. Um, so how this is done on two polarity, there is one view graph about this, but that's something that uh, we describe more in detail in the homeworks. And you can see how it is done for a realistic material, how this a curve give you which ZT, so that's a good exercise. I don't want to go over it uh, today. What is the issue if you want to do it for thin films? So this was done for thick films since 1950s, and actually some uh, companies use that in, for inline characterization of thermoelectric models uh, uh, all the time. The issue is if I have a thin film and I want to do the same uh, uh, Harman technique, I need to send a current that current create a temperature difference, so it's become like a micro refrigerator, and then I stop the current. So what are uh, some of the challenges? One of them is you need current, current injection uniformity. Why? Because often the devices where you can monitor things are 50, 60 micron, and the film is 10, 1 micron or so. Heat load from the probes or leads uh, need to be minimized. The whole Harman technique is valid if there is a temperature difference across the device and that temperature difference is balanced uh, by internal heat. If any of the heat goes to outside, this actually um, is a parasitic that is not part of the Harman technique and that uh, make the result erroneous. And finally, the other problem, which is more of a, a kind of a technical issue is 
what is the time it takes for a temperature difference here to disappear? If it's a bulk material, it could be seconds, it's easy to measure. For thin film, the time could be 0.1 to 10 microsecond. And the voltages we are talking about could be microvolt or millivolt. Measuring fast, tiny voltages is a challenge and that's something we describe how it's done. So this is at the end the kind of a mask for thin film ZT, simultaneous measurement of S, Sigma, uh, Kappa and ZT. And for that you see you have squares of different size. This is where the current flows in the substrate. And then you have side electrodes where the current is injected. And for some devices, the side electrode is narrow to minimize the heat leakage uh, to satisfy this uh, second condition. And for some of them, you have high um, uh, kind of wide contacts because you want to measure electrical conductivity without an additional resistive, uh, resistance in series. So you can do it by making simultaneous devices. Here are some measured temperature profile of these devices. You can see again the micro refrigerator, you send current, and here it creates Peltier cooling and heating as well as some joule effect in the device. There is a net, uh, there is a joule effect in the next because the current now is confined. We can separate Peltier from joule by looking at omega and two omega component. Um, actually, it's the other way around. So basically, the joule effect um, is current square. So when we do a thermal imaging, you saw in the electron thermoreflectance, we can separate the two omega component. And Peltier is omega. That's a great way to get the physics different. Here is the temperature profile versus distance. When we do a cross section across uh, going from one of the electrodes to the cooler. So basically going along the line this direction. And as you can see, the joule heating which is in the neck produces this type of bell-shaped curve and the Peltier cooling produces this type of uh, cooling on top of a device. These are measurements done uh, for devices from 50 by 50 micron up to 150 by 150 micron. Uh, it's kind of and the cooling and heating only a couple of degrees. But you can see that the modeling explains both the Joule and Peltier um, uh, uh, quite accurately. How this is done, uh, it's a little elaborate, but is a straightforward. You need to solve self-consistently finite uh, element thermoelectric transport for the three-dimensional structure. So basically, you make this as a grid. Then you have a heat balance equation where the temperature change is related to the conduction, Joule and Peltier heat sources. And then electrical current flows due to the ohmic flow as well as due to the uh, Seebeck voltages, that uh, 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 delta T's that create Seebeck voltages that change the electric field. By coupling, uh, solving coupled equation, that's how you got the previous values. The other question is how can I um, uh, get the tiny Seebeck voltages? The same idea as before, you have a device, you just turn off the device and at early times you see in hundreds of um, microsecond, 0.1 millisecond, the voltages are about 0.1 uh, 1 to 1.5 millivolt. These are done measurements at room temperature up to 700 Kelvin. This is an important tail because this has the Seebeck contribution to the voltage and by doing polarity positive and negative from this we can really get uh, the ZT of the material. How do you measure tiny voltages uh, at short times at high temperature? This is done in this um, special uh, uh, thermostat um, that is described here. The basic idea is that you need coplanar probes uh, to minimize electrical um, oscillation that happen at short pulses. Uh, coming to the device, uh, the, uh, and uh, so basically inside here is described in this article, um, you have to make some high temperature, um, high speed electrical contacts. At the end, uh, what do you get? Um, in this case, we have 20 micron film of uh, erbium arsenide with indium gallium arsenide should probably write it down. Um, so what are the number um, that, uh, what are the in-plane data we measured in the past uh, with thin film, two micron film, Seebeck coefficient was about 224 microvolt per Kelvin, in-plane conductivity was uh, about 350 per ohm centimeter. 
we didn't have measurement of the in-plane thermal conductivity. The cross-plane measurement using this high-speed technique give us 233 for Seebeck and 347 for uh, electrical conductivity, very close to the in-plane data. But we have a, even a second verification, finite element, that provided the whole temperature distribution also used these numbers. So again, very consistent. But not everything works all the time. There is a slight inconsistency. Both the cross-plane thermal conductivity data and the cross-plane finite element give us a thermal conductivity of 5 while in thinner films that were uh, th uh, only 1 or 2 micron uh, with the 3 omega technique we had measured 3. That's a discrepancy, could be a film to film variation. It's surprising that the electrical part is not as much sensitive but that's kind of one of the open questions. So basic idea is this type of devices where you make a tiny refrigerator can allow you to get the ZT directly but because with an optical thermoreflecting technique you measure the, volt, the temperature on top of a device directly you can separate individual component in the ZT and that's very advantageous. Let me um, uh, show the last view graph. Um, uh, an important device which is called uh, instrument which is called the Z-meter. Whatever I describe, it gives you the material properties. Often people are interested for energy conversion and for power generation. Uh, what you can do is that if you have a heater and um, uh, a temperature difference, by having um, multiple temperature measurements on this uh, gauge, you can see the heat flux. And by applying this um, uh, voltage generated to a thermoelectric to a very tiny load, you can actually measure the ZT of material directly. So this is a way to measure uh, a leg, single leg, Seebeck coefficient, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, output power, and even efficiency. And we have done it down to 50 micron thick materials. That's actually, uh, this is the work done in Rajiv Ram's group at MIT, and there are some related papers. Um, the advantage of this is that you don't need to build the whole model uh, to see what will be the efficiencies and limits. And uh, so you don't have the parasitics associated with model um, um, fabrication. Just to tell you how this uh, works is that um, uh, here we have a uh, erbium arsenide material 50 micron thick. ZT measures using this Z meter. Uh, these are the data points uh, obtained uh, using this instrument. And the dashed lines are the fit from the thin film data. So it really works and actually it shows the 50 micron thick material is has the same properties as the one or two thick material. That's one of the advantage of the MBE. Let me um, finalize uh, a summary of the lecture. I describe what is a thin film thermal characterization technique, especially 3 omega, some of the issues associated with that. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time on thin film electrical and Seebeck characterization, both in plane and cross plane. Cross plane is a difficult part of it. And you saw that a micro refrigerator uh, is a device that allow you to um, obtain both thermal and electrical properties directly on the same device using the transit Harman technique. And finally, if you can make the device, the material thicker, uh, 50 micron or 100 micron, then Z meter or such uh, uh, instrument can be used to measure the energy conversion efficiency and provide an ambiguous data. What we will do next time, uh, kind of in the last lectures for the characterization, is there is an important thin film thermal characterization which is based on lasers and is uh, sometimes called time domain thermoreflectance CDR and that's what we'll discuss in the next lecture. I look forward to see you.